In the last lecture, we talked about the growth of Roman control over Italy and the Mediterranean, and then uh, centered on the reign of the five good emperors, this period that Edward Gibbon marked as the peak of Roman achievements in all of Roman history. This was the reign of the emperors Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, and Marcus Aurelius. And we also looked at the condition of the city of Rome under these emperors. What we saw was the city of Rome did quite well. Public constructions of monumentally important uh, and massive scale took place under these emperors. They completely reshaped the way that the city looked and the way the city functioned. We also see that the material prosperity of the city of Rome during this period was immense. Uh, the broken pottery at Monte Testaccio alone speaks to a tremendous economic vitality that we see during the reign of these emperors. This lecture will look at the conditions in the Greek-speaking provinces of the empire, more or less these provinces that you see laid out on the map in front of you. Now when we think of the Roman Empire, the natural assumption is to think of this as a place in which Latin is the predominant language. And that's certainly true in the western parts of the empire. But in the east, the language that elites and many people just living in towns and villages across this region spoke was Greek. Uh, that is true of Sicily and southern Italy. It's true of the areas that are now modern Greece and eastern and western Turkey. But it's also true of places like Egypt and Syria uh, and Libya. And this is largely a legacy of Alexander the Great and the Hellen Hellenistic period um, kingdoms that followed Alexander's conquest of these regions. Greek was the language of administration. Uh, Greek was the way in which people spoke um, to those in power, and it was the way that elites communicated with each other. It was also the language of high culture. Now, the Greek-speaking parts of the world, around the Aegean in particular, had been part of Roman territorial control since the 2nd century BC. Uh, they had been part of Roman administration, or been administered by Republican generals and Republican governors, and they had not been administered very well. When Tacitus talks about the creation of the Roman imperial structure by the Emperor Augustus, he says something that is quite interesting. He says that provincials actually were happy about this. They definitely did not decline power being in the hands of one man because the governance of the Senate and the people was suspect to them. And this was because the competitions of the powerful and the greed of the governors, as well as the absence of any recognized remedy from the laws, which were undermined by violence, corruption, and ultimately money, made it so that things that were done in the provinces um, that afflicted or oppressed the people in those provinces could not be appealed to anybody who would respond. The Senate would not respond effectively to complaints about other senators because they were peers with the people about whom these complaints were lodged. But with an emperor in charge, someone now did listen to these complaints and the provincials understood this. They understood that the emperor had an interest in representing them and responding to their concerns. And what we see under the emperors is an increasing willingness to integrate people from the provinces into not just imperial administration, but the Senate as well. And so across the first and second century, we see senators being drawn first from provinces near Italy, but then ultimately from provinces in the Greek speaking part of the world. There's another aspect to this uh, that is really important to, to understand. When Augustus creates this provincial administrative structure, he does it in a way that gives tremendous autonomy to the cities and the people who run these cities. And so what you see is a combination of two things that really spark growth in the cities in the Greek-speaking part of the world during the Antonine Age. The first is a tax structure that makes sure that there is not extortion uh, and overtaxation as occurred during the Republic. And so a lot more of the money that was once um, in the hands of these provincials stays in the hands of these provincials. It doesn't go uh, to greedy governors sent by the Senate. It instead stays in their cities. 
Another aspect is, of course, the fact that these cities now have uh, a lot of autonomy that the emperor has given them. In the sense of the region that we're talking about, this is the area around the city of Ephesus, the largest city in Asia Minor and the largest city in the northern half of the Mediterranean that spoke Greek. Ephesus is a city in the 2nd century AD of about 200,000 or so people. It's the fifth largest city in the entire empire. Right now, Ephesus is a ghost town. Um, but this has a lot to do with the fact that Ephesus was once a major port. But the harbor of Ephesus silted up in the Middle Ages, and it went from being a port city to being five kilometers inland. And so Ephesus kind of lost its functional uh, importance and it didn't function in the way that it once had and so it began to shrink and eventually became um, an uninhabited area. But in the second century the documents we have from Ephesus show it to be a vibrant and wealthy city that was very much in control of its own affairs. And this is very much consistent with the model of local administration that was put in place by Augustus. In his reform of the Roman state Augustus had redesigned the way that provinces were given governors. Those with armies in them had governors that Augustus appointed. Others had governors that were chosen by the Senate. But with the notable exception of Syria and Egypt, most of the Greek-speaking provinces had governors that were appointed by the Senate. And what that meant was these governors were particularly deferential to local autonomy. The military governors that Augustus put in place, the governors who commanded armies, needed to be loyal to Augustus, and Augustus watched them very carefully because he didn't want them to use their armies in rebellion. Uh, but the cities and the, the territories under these senatorial governors were given a lot more leeway. And so while they were under the control of the emperor, the provinces and the government of them were actually technically administered by people called proconsuls, senators who were appointed by the Senate to administer the province. And proconsuls, in spite of the technical fact that they were in charge of the province, were absolutely were absolutely uh, commanded to be respectful of the independence of the various cities in the province for uh, anything that was related to the internal affairs of those cities. Now, we have a law that tells us about how governors uh, and proconsuls in particular were supposed to interact um, with the provincials under their control. So Ulpian, a jurist writing at the turn of the third century, uh, tells us that the proconsul, before he crosses the boundary into the province assigned to him, ought to send an edict in respect to his own arrival. And he needs to tell his predecessor when he's going to be arriving and when he's going to be crossing the boundary, because uncertainties and unexpected events are especially upsetting to provincials. And if the current governor doesn't know a new governor is arriving, there might be two governors in the province and the people might not know who to listen to. But once he's in the province, Ulpian tells us that there's a very specific set of op obligations that the proconsul has. He's supposed to tour the major cities in uh, all of the territory under his jurisdiction, and he's supposed to go into these cities and basically show the flag, you know, show that there is an imperial interest in those cities um, and an imperial interest in particularly uh, in clarifying and responding to the concerns that these people have. But when he arrives, there's a ritual to welcome him into each of these cities. We're told that when the proconsul arrives in some populous city, he should bear patiently a commendation of the city and hear without irritation the singing of his own praises, since the provincials hold that as a point of honor. Now, this is really important to understand, um, because when the proconsul arrives, he's going to be met outside the city by a parade of citizens, and they're going to escort him into the city. He's going to go to a theater or some other public space. He's going to listen to the rhetorician in the town, give an address, an oration that first begins by talking about how great the city is, and then talks about how great this governor is, usually talking off of a set of talking points the governor has provided for him. Now, the most interesting thing about this to me is the clause where the governor is supposed to hear without irritation these things. It doesn't sound like uh, something that you would be particularly irritated by, you know, listening to somebody sing your praises. But these governors spend between 12 and 18 months in the province. Most of that time they are traveling around. And when they're traveling around and they go into a place, they listen to this same kind of speech 
usually from some second-rate rhetorician in some second-rate town, and they have to look interested and enthusiastic. Because what this represents is a moment where the province comes forward and it speaks about itself to the governor. The governor shows his respect for that particular city as they speak about it on the terms that they speak about themselves. And then the city acknowledges the importance of the governor. And so it's a ritual where the governor acknowledges that the city is important and the people acknowledge that the governor is authoritative. It's in a sense performing the ritual of Roman imperial control. And most of the cities in Greece, Asia Minor, and even in Syria had city councils that would arrange these things and city councils that would administer the affairs of the city outside of the things that are directly demanded of it by the emperor or the governor. The council also chose the duties its members had to fulfill. And so there was essentially a list of public activities that needed to be performed in the city. And the city council would then select members of the council that, was resp that were responsible for doing them each year. <clears throat> the philosopher Plutarch, for example, lived in the city of Chaeronea in um, what's now central Greece. And one year he made somebody angry and he was forced to spend the year paying to clean the sewers. And Plutarch even writes a text where he says, I was proud to do this because my city asked me to do it. I am a proud resident of this city and I like to do the duty my citizens, my fellow citizens ask of me. But in the second century, many city councillors go beyond this and pay money for projects to beautify their city. So for example, um, Philostratus writes about the teacher and philanthropist Damianus of Ephesus. Damianus, Philostra says, was magnificently endowed with wealth of various sorts. And not only did he maintain the poor of Ephesus, but he also gave most generous aid to the city by contributing large sums of money and repairing any public buildings that were in need. Now, Damianus was a city councilor in Ephesus, but he went beyond just the things he was required to do. Instead, he helped fellow citizens and helped the city maintain things that otherwise could not be maintained. But Damianus went even beyond this. Damianus, we're told, connected the Temple of Artemis with the city of Ephesus by making an approach to it along the road that runs through the Magnesian Gate. This work is a portico, a stayed in length, all of marble. And the idea of this structure is that the worshippers need not stay away from the temple when it rains. When this work was completed, Damianus inscribed it with a dedication to his wife. Now, this is important to, um, this structure is important to understand but only can be possibly understood by looking at a map of the city of Ephesus. So what you see here uh, on the lower left is the harbor of the city, then the walled area um, with the gymnasium and the theater. And then you see all the way on the upper side of this map, the Artemisian, that's the temple of Artemis. And then you see stretching from the city to the Artemisian, something that's called the Porticus des Damianus or the portico of Damianus. This is what Damianus built. It's a very large and impressive work. It's a covered walkway with columns, kind of like what you see here, um, walking or, or leading from the theater down to the brown area, which is what used to be the harbor area. Um, this is another colonnade that you can see that, again, it's, gives you a sense of what we're talking about. But Damianus's colonnade is important not just because it provides a nice walkway for pedestrians, but because of what it leads to. The Temple of Artemis of Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the world. It was something that attracted a huge number of travelers and tourists um, and a large number of pilgrims. When the Apostle Paul is in Ephesus and you have the, the famous encounter that Paul has with the silversmiths, these are people effectively selling souvenirs to visitors to the Temple of Artemis. And so this is a big deal. And what Damianus has done is he's built something that is useful covered walkway to a temple that is a significant distance outside of the city that is useful um, but it's also something that everyone who uses will understand Damianus built and so Damianus built it because it's useful but Damianus also built it because he wanted credit he wanted people to know that he had done this and Damianus is not the only person in the Greek-speaking world to do these things. Elsewhere in Ephesus, uh, there is a library, uh, now called the Library of Chalcis, that is also built by a prominent donor. And in the city of Athens, 
we have a theater um, and public speaking area built by Herodotus Atticus, prominent city, our citizen of the city, and the Panathenaic Stadium. Uh, the stadium where the 1896 Olympics was held, this was also originally built by Herodotus Atticus. What's interesting about this is to the upper right of this picture is the area where Herodotus Atticus was, built, was buried. And so this stadium is a useful structure, but it's also a useful structure in which the person who built it is commemorated. And this is something that Herodotus Atticus felt very strongly about contributing to his city but also getting credit for doing it. Now uh, part of the reason for this building boom in the Antonine period was these people wanted to get noticed. But there's another reason that we see as well. These people had a tremendous amount of pride in their home cities. So for example, uh, during the reign of Hadrian, the city of Ephesus sent an appeal to him, complaining about how the other cities around them were talking about the city of Ephesus. The emperor Hadrian then wrote back to Ephesus and he said, I'm satisfied that the men of Pergamum have in their letters to you assumed the titles which I pronounce were for the use of your city. I believe too that the people of Smyrna have by mistake omitted these titles in their decree concerning the religious Congress. But in the future, they will gladly show a courteous spirit if you too, in your letters, appear mindful of the proper form of address which has been determined for their city. Now you can only imagine what the Emperor Hadrian must have thought when he got this letter. Three cities arguing about name calling. Um, and the response that Hadrian has is the same kind of response that you know, a parent of three-year-old twins fighting about something stupid will have. Just shut up treat each other nicely, and let's move on. Um, but beneath this is a really important sentiment that is worth understanding and worth acknowledging. This letter of Hadrian, a letter that basically says, this is ridiculous, please just get along and respect each other, is something that mattered so much in Ephesus that they inscribed it. They carved it in stone and posted it in their city so everyone could see it. These people firmly valued their prominence. They valued their city, they valued what it achieved, and they valued the titles that it had earned. They were Ephesians, and this was something that was valuable to them. Now, in the Greek-speaking cities of the empire in the Antonine Age, we see another feature that is in some ways related to this, this um this really prominent, important place and role that Greek legacy and civic legacy plays in the way these people understand themselves. And this is the immense popularity of rhetoric and the great fame of the people who taught rhetoric in this period. So in the third century, an author named Philostrus, who's looking back on cultural life in the second century Greek cities of the Antonine Age, describes the rhetoricians of this period as a group of thinkers whose skills rivaled those of the great figures of Greece's classical past. He called these teachers the second sophistic, or the movement they belonged to, the second sophistic. And in this, Philostratus is referring back to the culture of classical Athens um, and the sophists who flourished there. Now, in ancient Athens, sophist represented something uh, that were quite, it was quite an important element of the social life of the city and the political life of the city. Because what sophist taught was persuasion. They taught people how to make a case that was persuasive, um, how to tell people, how to give people the skills where they could go up before an audience and make an argument that they would listen to. And this is, of course, quite useful in a democracy. Uh, and 5th century Athens was really enamored with the skills these sophists taught because in this democracy you could speak, anyone could speak before the assembly and convince the assembly to take political decisions uh, in a particular way that they wanted. You also could speak in trials and bring trials, uh, bring cases against people and hire prominent teachers or speakers to defend your, your client or defend yourself at one of these trials.
And so this gave Sophists a very important role in the Athenian democracy. But there are also people who reacted against this, most notably Plato. And Plato is quite vicious in his attacks against Sophists. He says that they don't stand for anything, um, that there is such a thing as truth, and these sophists who just sort of focus on persuasion are not interested in truth. And instead, what they're really concerned with is making money. And in the short term, Plato wins this argument. Athenian democracy declines after the 4th century BC. The jobs uh, and the real political relevance of people trained in this sophistic diminishes. And philosophy becomes a much more valued cultural uh, and prestigious uh, cultural and uh, cultural artifact and source of prestige. And so sophistic sort of dies away. Um, it never disappears. But the prominence and the importance of these people uh, only starts to really reemerge after this sort of period when they're, they're secondary to, to uh, philosophers. It really starts to reemerge in the first century, in this, especially in the second century AD. And when Philostratus talks about this, he contrasts the sophistic of the second century AD with this ancient sophistic. The ancient sophistic, he says, uh, talked about courage and justice and heroes and gods and how the universe was fashioned. But the sophistic that followed, which we must not call new for it's old, but rather second, describes the nature of the poor man and the rich, of princes and tyrants, and it handles arguments that are concerned with definite and special themes from history. And the themes from history are particularly interesting because these themes from history that sophists in the second century AD talked about are things like this. The Spartan general advises his fellow citizens not to accept the return of men who had returned from Sphacteria without their weapons. Now this is a theme that was a favorite of a man named Marcus of Byzantium, a teacher of Marcus Aurelius in the second century AD. Just for the record, the captives returned to Sparta from Sphacteria in 421 BC, almost 600 years before Marcus of Byzantium spoke about it. Another 2nd century sophist, a man named Dionysius of Miletus, was famous for a speech in which he played the role of Demosthenes, an Athenian politician of the 4th century BC, a person who lived almost 500 years before he started his own career. So what's going on here? How do we understand the great prominence of these deep historical themes in the second century AD. <clears throat> well, a lot of scholars have argued that what you see here is an assertion of Greekness by a population living under Roman rule that has no political independence. And by this thinking, the second sophistic is a kind of way for Greeks to distinguish themselves from the Romans who control things. And one quotation from Philostratus seems to support this idea. Philostratus writes, here's another saying of Lucian, or of Lucius. The Emperor Marcus Aurelius was greatly interested in Sextus, the Boeotian philosopher, attending his classes and going to his very door. Lucius had just arrived in Rome, and he asked the Emperor when he was going out who he was going to meet and for what purpose. Marcus answered, it's a good thing even for one who's growing old to acquire knowledge. I'm going to Sixtus, the philosopher, to learn what I do not yet know. And at this, Lucius raised his hand to heaven and exclaimed, O oh, Zeus, the emperor of the Romans is already growing old, but he hangs a tablet around his neck and goes to school, while my emperor, the great Alexander, died at age 32. Now, the natural way to read this is that Lucius is contrasting Romans and himself. Um, the term emperor in this is actually the Greek word vasileus. Uh, and so at the conclusion, when Lucius says the emperor of the Romans, the vasileus of the Romans, hangs a tablet around his neck, but my vasileus, Alexander the Great, died at age 32, this reads as there are Romans and there is me. And I, Lucius, am a Greek, and I value the greatness of the past, and I value Alexander the Great, but I do not identify with the Romans. They are different from me. Um, now, why does this matter if Lucius is taking this position? Well, it matters because the people in this movement, these Sophists, were incredibly influential people. They spoke in massive structures. The Odeon of Herodotus Atticus, the theater at Ephesus, even the theater at Arles. These are places in which performances by these Sophists were given. 
And not only did they just speak about things, they did it in really entertaining ways. Um, these were entertainers, and each of them had their own distinctive style. Some of this consisted in a unique way of speaking. And so we see, for example, that some of them um, delivered their speeches in a sing-song manner. Uh, others would deliver them in sort of forceful prose with very deliberate uh, and very clear speaking styles. But each of them had their own signature way of delivering these orations in much the same way that rappers all have a distinctive and distinguishing way of giving their own performances. But the appeal of these people went beyond what they had to say and how they had to say it. These were people who were public figures with public identities. Um, and sometimes they capitalized on distinctive appearances or unique personal behaviors to build followings that their words and even their delivery wouldn't necessarily allow them to have. Uh, the most prominent example of this is a man named Favorinus. So Philostratus says about Favorinus that he was born double-sexed, a hermaphrodite, and this was plainly shown in his appearance, for even when he grew old he had no beard, and it was evident too from his high-pitched voice, which sounded thin, shrill, and high-pitched, with the modulations that nature bestows on eunuchs. Now, Favorinus is, of course, a non-binary, uh, non-binary in his gender. Um, but Favorinus understood that many Romans, most Romans, didn't know anyone like that, and that Favorinus uh, embracing this identity would be distinctive in such a way that people would pay for him to come and give orations, and people would pay to come and see him when he performed. This was good for Favorinus, and he capitalized on the interest that people had in seeing him to build an entire public profile around this. Uh, and so these characteristics defined his career. Um, but these characteristics that made one distinguished could also expose one to attack. So in the Eunuch, uh, a text that is written by the satirist Lucian, he describes a fictional competition for a public professorship between two teachers. Both of the teachers are equally knowledgeable, but one of them is a eunuch. Now, although this text is a fiction, Lucian's text is designed to bring to mind the case of Favorinus. And after each of the teachers in the competition had effectively argued each other to a standstill, a discussion began about whether a eunuch was suitable to teach philosophy. Now, what Lucian is doing here is he's poking fun at the conceit that sophists had that their competitions were really about the quality of their arguments or the quality of their speeches. What Lucian is saying is it's actually not about that at all. What this is really about is who's the most interesting. It's about who has the best uh, personal characteristics to become popular. And when they become popular, their jealous rivals will attack those characteristics rather than the quality of what they're saying. But sophists were more than just entertainers. They also played an educational role. They taught students how to, how to speak persuasively and effectively. Um, and they did this by giving students written exercises and forcing them to memorize the speeches given by their teachers. And so the idea was that students would learn virtue and proper conduct by learning these speeches uh, and understanding why the speeches were framed in that particular way. And so this is why these people are particularly important. If they are actually teaching a kind of independent Greek identity that is in contrast to Roman imperial control, this is borderline seditious, but there are structures that make sure that this idea is passed along. It is, in a sense, fundamental to the educational system of a lot of these Greek cities that students learn about this Greek past. And so if there's a seditious intent, it really should matter. If the second sophistic is really about Greek nationalism in opposed to Roman imperialism, well, there's a lot of mechanisms uh, that ensure that this idea gets out there and really resonates. So how powerful is this idea, this understanding of what these guys are doing? Well, I think it's more complicated than this is resistance to Roman rule. Um, because the identity of these people is not solely Greek or Roman. And this is true both of the sophists and also 
most notably of Roman emperors. So to give you a couple of examples of this, the Emperor Hadrian was born in the city of Italica in Spain. He grew up speaking Latin. Um, he came from the Western provinces, but Hadrian is one of the greatest patrons of the city of Athens. He was what you would call a Philhellene, a lover of Greek culture. And so he was both Roman emperor and archon, the chief administrator, the chief magistrate in the city of Athens. He was a citizen of Rome, but also a citizen of Athens. Um, and in Athens, he built really prominent and important constructions. So the most symbolic thing that Hadrian builds in the city of Athens is this, the Arch of Hadrian, designed to separate out the old Hellenic city from the new quarter that Hadrian is building on the other side of the arch. And you can see looking through it that the Arch of Hadrian actually frames the Acropolis. But on the other side of it is a series of um, luxurious urban, urban villas, um, bathhouses, and other structures that show Hadrian's commitment to building new and impressive structures on um, the general location of Athens as well. Um, within the city, Hadrian also built this. This is a massive library complex um, right in the center of the city of Athens that, of course, contains books, but also contains lecture halls, uh, a large central area for people to walk around and discuss things. Um, this was supposed to be a enclosed cultural center for the city of Athens. And, of course, the culture in this is overwhelmingly Greek. Uh, and so Hadrian is sponsoring these cultural elements that make the city, in a way, more embracing of its Greek legacy. Uh, and Hadrian also even finished this building, the Temple of Olympian Zeus, a piece of construction that had begun almost 700 years before by the Athenian tyrant Pisistratus. It was then suspended when Pisistratus fell, and the temple sat unfinished for nearly 700 years until Hadrian came in and finished it. And this is then a statement by Hadrian that his Roman imperial age represents a completion of this Greek classical past. Rome complements Greece. It doesn't conflict with it. It doesn't compete with it. Now, an be even better example of this blending of the Hellenic and the Roman comes from Marcus Aurelius. Marcus, too, was born in the West. He grew up speaking Latin. But he's also a devotee of Greek culture. So we saw earlier how even late into his life he attended lectures by Greek philosophers. He also wrote philosophical works of his own that were written in Greek, and he was responsible for endowing professorships in Greek rhetoric and philosophy in Athens. Marcus was also very indulgent and forgiving of some of the eccentricities of these Greek rhetoricians. Uh, nothing shows this more than when Herodes Atticus, the rhetorician and prominent Athenian citizen, comes forward uh, to defend himself in a criminal trial against Marcus. Hadrian, or when Herodes comes before Marcus, he launches into invectives against the emperor, and he did this not even using figures of speech in his oration, though it might have been expected that a man trained in this type of oratory would have had his anger under control. But with an aggressive and unguarded tongue, he persisted in his attack. Now, if we really were looking at contrast and conflict between being Greek and being Roman, you would imagine that Marcus would immediately clamp down um, and act really aggressively against, Had against Herodotus, because Herodotus, of course, is a Greek, and Marcus is, of course, the Roman emperor. But the reality is much more complicated, because Herodotus is from the city of Athens, but Herodotus is also a Roman citizen, a Roman senator, and a former consul in the Roman Empire. He is entirely Athenian and entirely Greek. Uh, but he is also entirely Roman and very prominently placed in this way. Both of those things exist together. And the emperor he's speaking before also is, of course, as Roman emperor, fully Roman. But as someone who every night meditates about the propriety of what he did during the day and how it can how it conforms to the teaching of Greek Stoic philosophy and then um, goes and writes in Greek uh, his own philosophical meditations about the day he too is very much Greek in his orientation 
These are figures who are both Roman and Greek in a way that is not inherently a conflict with each other. And so when Herodotus speaks before Marcus, he speaks as someone who is Roman and someone who is Greek. And he speaks before an emperor who is, um, in many ways, both Roman and Greek as well. And so this aggressive and unguarded attack on, Mar on Marcus Aurelius is something that Marcus responds not as an emperor responding to a subject person, a challenging a power dynamic, but instead an educated Roman responding to another educated Roman. He responds as a peer and he forgives Herodotus for this. What this shows is that ultimately when we're thinking about the second century uh, and the Greek world in the Antonine period, it's a much more complicated reality than there are Greeks who live under Romans. Because a lot of the Greeks who live under Romans, who adorn their cities with these wonderful things, um, who build these impressive structures, and who have so much pride in the city that they come from, are Roman senators too. They are both citizens of Ephesus or Athens and citizens of the Roman Empire. And when they interact with the empire, they do it both as subjects, but also as participants. And so the dynamic between Greek and Roman is more complicated. And we'll see soon um, how this is something that's advantageous to emperors moving forward.